How's everyone doing after the party? Slow morning. <laughs> it looks like slow morning. Um, cool. So does anyone know about Rainforest QA? If you all heard of us or not? A couple of people. Who uses us? Anybody? Probably not. Maybe one. Okay, cool. Well, uh, short version, I'm Russell Smith, the CTO and co-founder. We were founded in 2012. Uh, we've grown from like two to 150 people. Uh, there's me and my co-founder doing random stuff. And like there's us like a couple of weeks ago. We bring everyone on site because we're like a lot remote team. And so, uh, yeah, this is going to be a talk about some lessons learned building our own platform and also using um, other people's platforms. Uh, basically over the last seven years, because we've we've messed up a whole bunch of things, and there's also a whole bunch of things that we've learned and, and done pretty well. Um, so, yeah, uh, I'll talk to you about that. If the clicker works. Cool. So, um, I guess, like, stepping back a bit, the sort of reason we were founded originally is because we saw CICD was becoming a thing. In, in 2012, it was kind of bleeding edge, rather than cutting edge. Now it's maybe cutting edge, it depends on what size of company you are, but these are the sort of patterns that we saw. These are the challenges people have with quality in general, regardless of whether you're a platform or not. Um, hopefully some of these resonate with you, but um, the short version is that these are the sort of the top four things that we find. Like universally, like everyone thinks they're releasing too many bugs into production if they're actually shipping anything. Does, that, does anyone like disagree with that? You all are presumably shipping bugs repeatedly. Um, the other one is that CTOs and VP engines and leaders of quality also find it ridiculously hard to balance shipping fast with quality. Like, how do you make that trade-off? How do you deliver value to your customer but make sure it actually works? And so, yeah, that's another one, another high-level one. And then measurement. So measurement and linking it back to the business. Like, how do you invest in quality? Like, how much is too much? Like, should you make sure you have no bugs ever? Probably not. It's probably not worth the investment. Um, but then, should you just ship with no testing? Uh, again, probably that's going to affect your revenue in a, in a negative way. And so finding that balance is key. But how do you do it if there's no way to measure it? And so that's one of the, the sort of biggest problems that we see. Um, so for me, I wanted to go through a couple of examples of what I think of high quality platforms are and sort of why I think they are. And so, uh, but before I do, does anyone like have this experience? And so this is something, that, it's kind of a graph of what we think happens inside orgs with quality. It's like normally most orgs start with really good intent. Like they want to keep pace with it, they want to ship, they want to test stuff at the same time. But as things grow, either your team grows or the speed that your shipping grows or increases rather, uh, it tends to end up turning into firefighting and turning into sort of something that your business can't keep pace with. And so, yeah, generally this is the pattern that we see that this giant coverage chasm forms and you end up shipping stuff that you're not entirely confident about. So anyway, the kind of key here, um, the key takeaway for this is like that that is subjective, is different per company. And the biggest problem with this is that it means that well, it's generally quality is reinvented and means different things to different companies and also different things to your customer. So you have to have a deep understanding of what that actually means. And so we're working on, uh, not I'm going to talk about it today, we're actually working on tools to like objectively measure this. Turns out it's pretty hard to get right. Um, but anyway, watch the space. But even before that, you have to figure out a way of measuring your quality so you know what, you, what to improve on and not reinvent it. And then like, yeah, is, uh, as I just said, is, is never measured well. And so if you don't measure something, how can you improve it? How can you know where you are? And so if you're not measuring the quality of your platform today, whatever that means to you, you, to, you should figure out how to do that. Um, so diving into like who actually has a high quality platform, in my opinion, um, this is just in my opinion. These are some of my favorite platforms. I just sat down and thought, what are my favorite platforms? Which ones do I love and, and kind of why? And so for me, these are, these are some of the ones that I respect and I actually use um, regularly and also um, uh, I think are good. So why? Uh, so AWS, uh, I'm guessing almost everyone uses either AWS, GCP, or Azure. I think actually all of them are high quality. Personally, I use uh, GCP and uh, AWS. But the main reason why is they just work. They do exactly what you expect them to do. They have good docs. 
AWS particularly has very comprehensive services, all with a very good stand of docs, a very clear way of buying them, a clear way of interacting with them. And for me, it, it's great. They're like medium easy to try out though, because they're not quite as simple as my uh, sort of number one favorite, which is Twilio. Twilio for me is probably the best example of a really simple to use platform. It's very deep as well, but to get started, you can use like literally a single line to, to send a text message to start using it and to get hooked. Like for me, that's the dream for Rainforest QA is like, can I get some way of you running one line in your browser as a, uh, in your command line as a developer and get some value out of it and then iterate from there? The answer is no, we can't, not today, but it's the aim. The other thing is their pricing is, um, is super simple and also it's, way, way harder to solve it yourself. If you imagine what it would take to send a text message as an engineer without Twilio, it's like you end up having to go back to the old school, sign up for some random service, put in your credit card, do all this extra jazz, and then it's pretty hard. So if you can get there, that's the best. I'm gonna give one example of a sort of medium good platform that we use that I actually love and also have issues with. So Domo, I don't know if anyone uses Domo, or apologies if anyone's here from Domo, but, um, I have a love-hate relationship with Domo. So Domo, we actually integrated directly into Rainforest and it's given some really good value to our customers. We didn't have to build out graphing, we didn't have to build out dashboarding, we can just pump in data from our production thing and then process it with like no load on our, on our system. But <laughs> the main downsides and the things that I've learned from integrating with them is that documentation is really, really terrible. We're on a sort of fringe-ish edge case use of it, which we weren't aware of at the time. Uh, and then also the API is terrible. Like the, the, the results back from it are really not good. So getting support for a fringe edge case with bad docs and a sort of an API that gives spurious errors is really hard. And so I never want to deliver that to our customers. And they, to be honest, they have improved over time, but still. Um, and this is how I kind of think about stuff. It's a sort of, I plot things on a sort of four segment quadrant quite often, and this is my sort of pain to value scatter graph, I guess you could call it. And so it's hard to easy for how, how it is to integrate or use them, and then how valuable it is from like not valuable in my opinion, uh, or for me, and then to highly valuable. And so like Domo for me is valuable, but it's on the left end, so it's super hard. And then anyway, kind of the point of this is like, if you are trying to integrate with something or even evaluate where you are, what I like to do is get customers to put this on, um, when they integrate with us, put what they're using on, A, so we can see what they're using and where we fit in the ecosystem, and then B, how they think of us. And then I can ask them, hey, what would it take me, take us to move us up and to the right? How do we make this easier for you? What were the pain points? And so more of this is, I use this as a sort of jumping off point for a discussion around how we can improve. So I'm like, place yourself anywhere. Even if you place yourself where segment is for me, which is top right, amazing docs, amazing API, good pricing. I'm still gonna ask you, how do we get better? But by making someone place yourself on the graph, it starts that conversation for me. So some lessons learned. There's three quick lessons and then some best practices as well. So. Uh, this is one that I actually learned from our sales team, but it applies exactly back to platforms. And it's, has anyone heard the phrase, time kills all deals? Yeah, it's a classic one. So the longer something takes to do, or the longer a process is, generally, the more likely it is to fail. There's more things that could go wrong, more variables. And so these are the classic ones, like for us at least, uh, buy finds another solution. <laughs> great, they've gone to a competitor, or they've built it themselves, or something else, they've done it in-house. Um, or the environment changes. Maybe the buyer either disappears, or his budget disappears, or his, his or her budget disappears. Uh, so like, the short version is, if you can, I put TDV, it's probably an internal jargon, but time to value. We're constantly focused on how can we prove value faster. At the moment, we can do it in like 20 to 30 days. We would love to get the sort of the Twilio level of things where it's like 10 minutes. You just type in your credit card and use an API and then you're like, oh, this works, cool. We're not there yet. Then the same with faster integration and simpler pricing. Like um, for us, I've learned our pricing is pretty complicated. 
it's not as complicated as it once was, but we've still got a way to go to like, uh, like Twilio style pricing. For me, by the way, I actually consider AWS's pricing pretty convoluted and just accepted because of the upside, but uh, maybe I'm the only one. Um, so the second one is like understanding your customer stack. And so, as I said before, I normally get customers to show us what they're using in the sort of workflow uh, that they use Rainforest in, like, and also around that. So basically for us in the software development lifecycle, what tools do you use? What do you use them for? How would you like to fit us into this? And so um, this is just some examples, but for us, like for instance, Jira, uh, a lot of engineering teams use that. When they use us, what do they want to do with it? And that turns out it varies team by team. Um, but the point is, by plotting all these things out and asking these few questions, so like what's also, sorry, monitoring these things. So we also look at what's changing inside Jira just to pick on Jira. So what are they shipping? What are the new best practices for Jira? Because if our integration with them is like the old school way of doing it and everybody's moving to a new way of doing it, that's not good. So keeping up with the trends inside these tools and how people are using it, which is all over the place, is super important to us. So we can get a tighter, better integration. Also make sure it's flexible enough to fit these new ways of working. So uh, the sort of third one, which is a lesson learned, and specifically for some of the platforms we've integrated with, is like look around at other people's experiences. Like I wish, for instance, I had asked more about, uh, I'm not gonna name names, but other, pl other platforms when we integrated with a certain platform, mainly because I would have heard back, hey, the, the API doesn't work, it goes down all the time, their pricing's like kind of not exactly open, it's not exactly what you expect, but anyway, the point is, I, and it's not Twilio, by the way, but the, the point is you can dig in by asking your peers, asking your friends, what happens? And so for me, I would check Stack Overflow, I would check GitHub, I would ask my CTO group, and ask them, hey, what have you used in the space? And so peer feedback really matters, um, and has, I've underused, is a, a kind of lesson there. So um, some breast, uh, best practices for me. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the sort of GTM side. And so this, this sort of high level ones from easy to understand for me and the most important ones, and this is the stuff we're trying to fix inside Rainforest, by the way, is pricing. We want to make our pricing super simple for understanding. Like originally we priced um, in credits. Um, and so then we had to explain the concept of what the credit was for, and it was for a step, and people are like, what is a step? How many of those steps do I need? Do I need 1,000? Do I need 50,000? And it's really hard for people to predict. And so we've moved to pricing by tests, which turns out is also convoluted, like in a different way, but people get it more than they did the previous one. So we've, we've pushed forward a little, but we're constantly striving to make that pricing simpler so people can sort of understand what they're gonna end up using. Um, a couple of things we've done there, which have been kind of interesting is, we used to sell contracts which were, well, basically the AE and the customer would figure out, hey, we think you're gonna use about this much, so maybe you should buy this contract. Sometimes they're over and the customer's like, hey, I didn't get value because I didn't use all my stuff. And then sometimes they're under and they're like, well, you told me it would work in this much, but now I have to pay you more. And so either way, it's kind of like, what, what is going on there? And so now we've moved to a way of uh, what we call a calibration phase, which is where we, we give you a medium amount and then we say, hey, you can either, like, we, you expect them to upsell. You expect them to buy more stuff, and then you expect them to either lock in or keep variable, variable pricing. And so that, for us, has been working pretty well. Um, but either way, whatever you find, like simpler pricing uh, is, is key, at least for us. The other one is easy to understand tech. We had many different terms for the stuff inside our product, many different things which were sort of close to industry standard, but maybe weren't industry standard. And so when you come up across like, um, a word that you're used to and then you look at a product and you're like, hey, that's the same word but it means something different. It's really confusing. And so naming inside your tech, uh, at least for us, we've messed up and so we're trying to get back on track. Uh, and then the no silver bullet thing is, does anyone, well, at least when we pitched uh, Rainforest early, we were like, this is a silver bullet. We will solve all of your QA problems. Uh, does anyone else have that same pitch or had that same pitch years ago, probably? 
Yeah. Right now. Okay. Well, anyway, the short version is like uh, figuring out that you fit into a workflow and fit into an ecosystem and embracing partners. I'm sure you all do because of this conference, but uh, that's taken us like a good four or five years to figure out. Um, so, yeah, partner success is pretty obvious, but the two that uh, we've learned is we need to make sure that people can make money when they're reselling uh, our products. Pretty obvious. Sometimes it's not true, though. Um, and then how can they support their customers? So these are two key things for us. And the support one is pretty interesting. It's, do they want to support them through you? Do they want to support them themselves? How, do they have the right resources? And this goes on to having amazing docs, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. But uh, yeah, so uh, for the technical side of things, so there's this phrase that we have internally, which is like API is the new MSA. And so going back to Twilio or like any kind of dev-centric platform, if they can try the API and get value from it, what, what do you need an MSA for? You're probably going to get one eventually, but kind of the point is that they're not going to go through a sales process with you. They're not going to need to if they can just try your products and get value super quick. We want to get there. We're not there yet. Um, then obviously, like if you don't have an API, how many of you have APIs for your platforms? So not all of you. How many of you want APIs that don't? Some of you don't care. OK, cool. Well, anyway, you probably should care if you have anything. Well, unless you've got a really good reason. But anyway, if you don't know what it is, you probably all should. But API is just a defined way to interact with your platform. So uh, engineers can use it to talk to your stuff and make it do stuff. But um, yeah, if you do have one, uh, one of the key things is versioning it. And so most people don't version their API properly. Kind of the main reason why is there's no good way of doing it. There's no single practice, best practice for this. Um, there's a couple of blog posts you should read if you want to figure out how to do this. But anyway, the short version is there's no, there's no good way. The best practice, also the leader on this that I've seen is actually Stripe. They have a really good way of doing it. They seem to have it locked down. What this actually means for you, though, is that um, your customers, when they integrate with you, can trust that this is going to work the same way for a long time. And so what that means is that they don't have to repeat work. They don't have to repeat the integration or fix broken integrations. That's great for them, but it's also great for whoever they're selling to or whoever gets on your platform. And so this is why it's super important to version your API properly and not make backwards, backwards breaking changes. Uh, docs, uh, as I said earlier, like docs can make someone's life super, super painful or super easy. So like nailing down your docs, really important. Uh, we actually at some point will hire someone specifically to do docs. We haven't yet. So that's the problem is it's spread all over the place inside the company. So getting great docs means focusing on it, at least from my point of view. Um, also, like at least for me, is if you have an unstable API, that means your docs are probably unstable too, which is a chain down the path of like doom, unfortunately. Um, so I have good docs. Change logs. Uh, how many of you have change logs for your platform? <laughs> like two. OK, cool. Well, you should all have them. Because like, how, otherwise, how do people know what's changing? How do, how do your people integrating with you using your platform know what is coming or what has changed on your platform? The only way is by talking to someone or reading this. Anybody doing a sort of technical integration with you is not going to want to talk to anyone, mostly, or at least. I don't like talking to people about this. I'd much rather read it. So this is, again, Stripe. Um, they have a really good change log. Everything that they ship, everything that they change, it sh shows you what is happening, uh, what version it's in, what you can expect to happen. So like, you should do a change log. We have a change log. There's a, I can't remember the name of the service, but there's a, a sort of paid service pretty cheap that you should use. Uh, find me afterwards if you're interested. Um, sandboxes. How many of you have sandboxes for your, your uh, two, three? OK, cool. Not very many. Well, anyway, sandboxes make anyone doing an integration way easier. Does everybody know what one is? Yeah, mostly. Well, if you have the power to do it, you should probably try and get one. And the main reason why is it makes whoever's integrating with this stuff way, way easier. It makes QA way, way easier because you don't, you're not testing stuff in production. But it also means that you can try out integrations before either spending money or using resources or uh, wasting a lot of time. Uh, good examples of this, Salesforce and PayPal have like really good support for, for sandboxing. There, there are others as well. Um, sunsetting. Does anyone suns formally sunset stuff? Only 
three the same people. Good. <laughs> <laughs> That's unsurprising. But for those of you that don't, um, yeah, sunsetting is the kind of process of how you get rid of stuff. And so, like, this is also really key for anyone that you integrate with or anyone using your platform. It's like, how long is this going to go along for? How long until it disappears? And so uh, by having a formal process, it's like, hey, we're going to keep this alive for at least six months. We'll announce this schedule. This is how we normally roll it out. Super important because people rely on this in their business, or they should do if it's worth doing. And so like, uh, generally, like when we do that, we give good notice. Uh, we give a migration path that's like, hey, we're removing this API endpoint and removing this whole service. Here's where we think we should, you should go. Well, this is what you should do if you're using this. Um, and then also, like, what actually happens when it turns off? It's pretty obvious, but not always, uh, not always obvious either. Like, what's the failure mode for this? Um, and then, yeah, that's pretty much it. A kind of quick rant from me. Any questions? First, thank you so much. Cool. All right, I'm gonna. I'm going to kick it off here. So integrations are absolutely the most important thing in SaaS. We had that takeaway this morning already. Uh, a lot of people, you know, our job is to make the sale. And as much as I love Domo, because my, half my home entertainment system is thanks to your sales team, uh, the reality is when you're doing, selling any kind of platform or integration, you're actually selling a connection between one inter engineering team and the other. And that is a human sale, right? Involves a lot of these uh, tools and assets. But how would you recommend people uh, work with their engineering teams or their engineering teams to make the sale to make sure that, that the people are comfortable. Yeah, it's a good question. I think the main one is actually making that happen. Like, <laughs> it's kind of obvious, but it's not always the case. You actually get to talk to an engineer. And so, especially when you're on a sort of fringe-ish edge case, like one that you want to do or one that somebody wants to do on your platform, and it's not a normal one, then, uh, I mean, the thing that I'm learning is there needs to be some way around that. There needs to be some process, like, exception where you actually get to talk to someone who's an engineer rather than just, like, a forward deployed engineer or, like, CSM or something. Um, and that's where most of the problems that I've ever had have been from is not being able to talk to an actual engineer fast enough. Domo specifically. <laughs> well, you know, I'm sure your home entertainment system. Oh, yeah, I'm sure it's bought by Domo too. Yes, fantastic. <laughs> um, and then, like, everyone, I mean, how many people have had their, their system go down and have to go to the partners and apologize because their API? Yeah. So, very common problem. Uh, as a business person, our job is to remove risk, I mean, especially as partnership people. How do you go back as the business side and go back to our own engineering teams and say, hey, we need to de-risk this. These are the things we need to do. I mean, you gave a good roadmap of actually what a platform should have. But how do you start that conversation in a way that the engineers don't go, business guy, get out of my face? What about, like, as in how do you move towards, like, having an SLA that people actually care about internally? Yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, it's actually a hard one. But the, the first one is, like, caring about it. So one of our, uh, like, most of you probably have top-level metrics, which are, like, the platform shouldn't go down and the sort of smarter version of that. But that's one of the things that we've had in the last sort of three years is actually, like, KPIs around that around internal SLAs, which are like harder than the external SLAs. And so that's the thing is, is A, doing that, and B, we rely on our own platform. So we, we dog food heavily. It's not possible for everyone, but like that has helped us a lot because if it's down, we can't do anything either. So. And then my last question is compliance is becoming a huge issue uh, now, and a lot of QA issues are security related, data breach, that kind of thing. How can, uh, as platform managers, think about the risk of that, manage that, especially with our technical teams, and get them to build platforms that are safe? Yeah, I mean, that's a really hard question, um, mainly because like it's mostly an unsolved problem, and it's constantly evolving. So at some point, you just need to double down and hire a security team or use an external uh, team constantly for that. Uh, like, yeah, that's the only answer I've got is, like, now we have an internal team for compliance because we do, like, HIPAA compliance and we're working on some others as well. But, yeah, it's not not an easy problem. And so uh, the only bit of advice that, other than just hire a team is that for us it's been very good not having that person inside engineering. They've been sitting next to engineering reporting to, the, like, VP Eng, but they're not technically inside the Eng team itself. 
Um, and so that's uh, caused some tension, uh, but in a good way. As in, they're fighting for their mission rather than being part of the end team and like running through it normally. And so that, that's been great for us. That's interesting, like a clean room methodology. Yeah, it's like a, a separate team. Yeah. It's an se entirely separate team, not really an engineering team. And so they have the power to do stuff and block stuff, but it's, uh, it's definitely caused tension, but in, in a good way. Right. Fantastic. Any questions? The audience? All right, thank you so much, thank you. Russell. Thank you. That was really great, actually.